This Tuesday is Veterans Day. Hopefully you saw that on your calendar or were aware of that. And uh, if, I, if my history is correct, I believe that Veterans Day uh, is a continuation of the celebration of the end of World War I, the treaty that was signed that, that uh, I guess, armistice, more correctly, that ended the First World War and 96 years ago, I believe. And that's really what started the tradition of Veterans Day. And that was a big deal. The, the, the Great War, or as we know it, World War I, that was the war to end all wars. It was really the first time that the world was at war on a massive scale, and that ended. And that was quite a celebration. Obviously, we had another world war after that. But it was a time where so many people uh, lost husbands, sons, um, and, and people that were killed in the war. A lot, many, many civilians were killed in the war. Um, a day was set aside to honor and to remember those that gave their lives. And we continue that tradition today. And I, I think as Christians, it is important for us to value that service because it protects our freedom to worship, which many, 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 many millions of our brothers and sisters in Christ do not have, especially in places like China and North Korea and Iraq now and other places in the Middle East. And so, so take a moment to thank the veterans in your life, the veterans in our church, the veterans in your family, um, because it's a special day, and I think sometimes in our culture it just kind of gets blown right by and we forget that. Um, but but I, I, for one, am very grateful and thankful uh, for all those that have served and, and of course, those that have given their life uh, for my freedom. Today we're going to look at Mark chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to that. And we're going to, I know this may be surprising, you, you probably won't believe me when I say this, but we're actually going to stay in Mark chapter 12 the whole time. Ooh, I know. It's, it's scary, isn't it, to think that we could not flip around to 10 different places. Now, it's scary for me because I'm worried you all might go to sleep. I don't know. So I'm going to have to keep it interesting somehow. But we're going to camp on the parable of the vineyard owner. Okay, now this is a different parable than the parable of the vineyard. Okay, so don't get those two confused. It's found in Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. And this last uh, week, now some of you guys may or may not know, my wife and our family is embarking on a new adventure. Uh, we have 45 acres under contract, just about 10 minutes away in Sparta. And uh, we're going to do cattle and, and farm, and it's going to be kind of a whole different thing for us city dwellers. Well, my wife's, you know, she's from Bolivar, so she probably, I don't know, it's arguable whether or not she's a city dweller. But for me, being raised in the city, this will be a big change, which I am very excited about. We've been praying about this for years and years. And uh, um, I went this last week and helped my father-in-law on his farm and uh, just helping, but also wanting to learn all the things that I'm going to need to know. And among those things is building good fence. Because if you don't have a good barbed wire fence or a good voltage fence, your cattle are going to get out and that's just not a good thing. Especially when it comes time to sell them, you're not going to have anything to sell, which is bad. So I've been learning about fence posts and, and various other things on the farm. And I've learned something really fascinating about a fence. The most important component of any good fence is the corner post. All right. Now, if you're not familiar with a corner post, the corner post is basically the, the post that's on the edge. You know, usually there's like a 90 degree corner or, you know, depending on how different people's land lays, but there's a 90 degree corner where you put a, a post and that post gets pulled on by both sides of the fence. And if it's not anchored in there really, really good, then when you go to stretch the barbed wire on the, the length of the fence, which can be hundreds and hundreds of feet, the one we did this week was probably, I don't know, 300 feet or so, then that thing's just going to pull right out of the ground and your whole fence is, you know, the integrity of it is splat. And you've probably seen, if you've driven around it all out in the country, you've seen some corner posts that weren't, you know, made so well. And then the whole fence is kind of leaning or sagging and that's just not a good thing. And so my father-in-law, he's kind of old school. He doesn't go to MFA and buy posts. He goes out to the woods and cuts them down himself. So we went out to some, some of his land. We cut down a big hedge tree and you use hedge because it's a, just a real thick, meaty wood. And you stick it in the ground, it's going to be there for 50 plus years. So we went out, chainsaw, cut down this, you know, 10 foot uh, section of, of hedge and, and put it, dug a hole three feet in the ground, which is quite a task. And uh, with little hand tools, we didn't have a, like a, a big digger, just a shovel and a post hole digger and a couple little hand tools. 
And then we poured some concrete and anchored that thing in the ground. And I tell you what, by the time it was all said and done, that corner post was solid as a rock. And it is going to be there for a long, long time. But I learned the value of that, that corner post. And then you, you support it to an, a, a anchor it against a post that's next to it. And you know, some people take rocks and they bury them in the ground and they tie them to the rocks. And there's all kinds of crazy things that ranchers do to keep those corner posts still. Because, again, you gotta, you got to have that. And it reminded me of this story of the parable of uh, the vineyard owner. It's the same idea that if we don't have the right foundation, if we don't have the right starting place, we really cannot accomplish anything significant in life. And let's just take a moment now and, and look at this scripture and uh, study the meaning that is found in, in this parable. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. Now, you guys know what a vineyard is, right? That's where grapes are. You know, you can use them to make wine or grape juice or different things, that, or other kinds of fruity things, but it's where you grow grapes. And, and it's called a vineyard because grapes grow on vines and usually have a trellis or some kind of something that they, they can grow all over, and then that makes them nice and healthy, and then you get all the grapes and you gather them up. Okay, all right, so just make sure we're all on the same page. I know, it's just a lot of farming today. Sorry, it's just it's on the brain. It's what I'm excited about, so look out for the next few weeks. Uh, it's gonna, it's now, once we close in December, I think December 22nd is the day we close, it'll probably calm down. But until then, lots of farming and ranching analogies. All right, in scriptures. Uh, so a man planted a vineyard, he put a fence around it, dug out a pit for a wine press, and he built a watchtower. And then he leased it to tenant farmers, and he went away. And at harvest time, he sent a slave to the farmers to collect some of the fruit of the vineyard from the farmers. Okay, so this is not an unusual scenario, even for our time. So you have somebody that, that owns land, they've developed the land, they've kind of gotten it all ready, and now they've leased it to someone else. And, and now these other people are leasing their land. Okay, leasing means you don't own it, you're just kind of borrowing it for a while. And uh, the guy who owned the, the farm, he or the vineyard, I guess more precisely, uh, he sends now a, a servant to go and to collect. Right, let's see what happens. They took him, in verse 3, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Well, now that's just not very nice, right? I mean, you would think he was, he's going to get his rent or his portion of the, the grapes or whatever it is. And um, so he sends somebody to go in his stead. And the, per, the, the tenant, the person leasing, beats him up and sends him on his way. That's not good, all right? I mean, that, that's a terrible problem. So again then, he sent another servant to them, and they hit him on the head and treated him shamefully. Then he sent another, and they killed that one. And he also sent many others, and they beat some, and some they killed. Can you even imagine? I mean, that's hard to imagine that happening. That you would be such a poor steward of the land that you're leasing that you would not only not pay what you owe to lease the land, but to injure the messenger. You know, I guess perhaps the, uh, this, the phrase, don't kill the messenger, maybe it comes from this parable, I don't know. But, uh, okay. So let's go on. He still had one to send. All right, so he'd sent all kinds of people, and now he has one, he's going to try one more time to collect from this vineyard, from this land. And this is his very own son. And finally, sent, he sent to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those tenant farmers said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they became very greedy, very selfish. They conspired against the owner of the, of the land. And they said, let's, let's kill his son in that way. Maybe we'll, we will inherit the farm rather than his heir. But they, those that are the tenants, they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. And therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the farmers and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this scripture? Now, Jesus does an interesting thing here. He, he quotes a passage from the Old Testament. All right, and, it, and it's actually, if you're curious, it's actually found, don't turn there because then you'd make a liar out of me, uh, but it's found in Psalms 118.22, okay, so he's quoting this particular verse, and this is really the, 
the purpose of him telling this parable, okay, because he's commenting on what would be for him the scriptures, right? Because the, the, they didn't have the New Testament in New Testament times because it was being written or hadn't been written yet. But they did have the Torah or the law, the, the, the books of, of the Old Covenant. And so he quotes from Psalms, and here's, here's that quotation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from the Lord and is wonderful in our eyes. And because they knew he had said this parable against them, they were looking for a way to arrest him. But they were afraid of the crowd, and so they left him and went away. Okay, now they is the Pharisees, okay, the Sadducees, the religious leaders that had, were constantly butting heads and setting traps for, for Jesus. All right, and that idea of the cornerstone is a very important one. All right, flip back to that main title slide there, uh, Jordan, and, and so we can kind of get a visual picture of that. You may have saw that earlier. All right, so a cornerstone is very similar to a corner post. Okay, it's the same idea. A cornerstone is the stone on the corner of the building where all the weight rests from, from both sides of the building. In fact, if you have a basement or a walkout or a call space or something, you can go under your house and look at that, and you'll see these big girders. And they both meet, and they sit on something, You know, usually like a concrete-formed wall or a, a concrete... Uh, pier is what crawl spaces are built on, but some kind of really uh, massive load-bearing uh, structure of some sort. Because it's a big deal. If you lose that, that corner, then the whole thing just kind of falls into the ground. And that's why you know, water damage and things like that that erode or, or damage cornerstones is, is a big problem. It's a big deal. So this idea of, of the cornerstone is really the idea that it's the foundation of something. It is that which everything else is built upon. All right, now, who, who in the story is the son? Anybody realize who, who's being talked about? Jesus, right. Jesus, okay? And you think about God. He's the owner, right? He's the owner of everything. He owns everything, the universe, the earth, all the things that we have that sometimes in our minds we think we own. You know, in my mind, I think that pretty soon I'm going to own a farm, but really it's God's land, and I guess very literally he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, so he's going to own all my cattle too. So God owns everything. He's, we are the tenants, all right? And in the story, it's, it's the, uh, the Pharisees more specifically, but the story is really about any of us who become selfish and greedy, and we, we think that we are the, the ones that should have and should own, and it should be our decision to do anything, really. And so Christ is this cornerstone, The stone that the builders rejected from verse 10 there. So in other words, the people that are building this house, they're building civilization, they're building whatever, you know, we could make this parable fit a lot of different uh, idea, ideas or philosophies. But the basic idea is that anything we build in life, and I think particularly how we build our own personal lives is probably the most uh, applicable context for this particular story has to be built on that cornerstone on Christ. If we don't build on that, if we reject, in other words, if we're like the builder that rejected that stone, that foundation is going to, that whole structure is going to collapse. It's going to come down. It's going to be made into nothing. It's going to be just a pile of rubble. And I don't know about you, but I don't think that's how I want my life to, to end. I don't want to get 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old and my life just fall apart because of me laying the wrong foundation in my life. But it happens. It happens. Why does it happen? Well, we, we see the elements of that in the story. We see that the Pharisees, they didn't want to be deposed of their power, and of their wealth. and their. I mean, they, they had built up a, a financial and a, a, an empire of fame. Because they had created all these different things for people to do that benefited them. And they got the glory. They got the honor. Rather than Christ, they got the glory and the honor for those things. And people looked up to them and thought, oh, wow, you know, how great are you? And they would, they would uh, wear this very expensive purple dye in their prayer shawls and, and different. They would do just different things like that to, to separate themselves apart from the rest of the people so that people would look up to them rather than to focus on, on God. 
And so I think that for us, we, we struggle with the same types of challenges, whether to build our own kingdom and, and to make our life all about us and what we want, or to make it about serving others. And so it's really a choice. The parable is a challenge to choose, which most parables are. I mean, they, they teach a, a, a hidden lesson with a hidden meaning that permeates across time and space, which is pretty amazing. You know, to have, a, to have a story, to have a lesson that goes beyond the context in which it was given. Because we, we, we're familiar, we know the, the literal context of it. But to realize that we can take this parable and apply it to our own lives. I think is a fantastic and, and phenomenal thing. So then let's, let's think for a minute about Jesus in this example, about his representation of that cornerstone. And I want to, I want to ask you to, to begin to think for just, a, for just a couple moments about your life. And I want you to begin to put in your mind all of the things that you've built your life on. What are the things that you highly value? What are the principles that, that if someone were to, to be your friend, family member, somebody that knows you well, that they could point at your life and say, well, I think you've built your life around these things. Maybe it's education. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's business. Building an empire of, that, of different businesses and things. Or maybe it's um, farming. Maybe it's having lots of livestock and crops. Maybe it's uh, building a, uh, an empire of, de of collecting degrees and, and other things. Maybe it's just free time. Maybe you just love your hobbies and you kind of forsake everything or you do the minimum amount in the rest of your life so that you can get home to or get out to you know, the golf course or, or out into the woods or whatever it is, wherever your hobby is. You just love that so much that everything just kind of revolves around it. And I want you to just think about what that is for you. Because, you know, for all, I think it's different for each of us. I don't think we have the same things that, that uh, are, another way to say it would be idols. You know, it was a big deal at this time. If you worshipped an idol, that was a bad thing. You know, and I, I know that for some of us, we think of that illustration and we think, well, that's weird. I would never worship an idol. But an idol is just very simply not only a graven image or a statue, but an idol is anything that kind of becomes that ruling force in our life. Uh, for example, I can remember when I was younger, I had a number of idols in my life. Uh, you know, different things that I loved. I loved computer stuff, techie stuff, and, you know, I always wanted to have the latest, coolest things, you know, in technology. So that was kind of an idol for me, or I, I highly valued free time, and, and so I just, you know, have, being able to do my hobbies, um, you know, any, anything that really distracts us, it becomes more than, I mean, and don't hear me knocking hobbies, hobbies aren't bad, I mean, it's, we need to relax, we need to get away, but if that's what our world is built around, then it's something that we've got to, to begin to challenge and ask ourselves, well, what, what should we build ourselves around? Now, obviously, the church answer is, well, Jesus, okay? I mean, if, you're, if you ever get asked a question in church, hopefully you realize that there are just a few basic responses. If you say Bible, the Bible, God, or Jesus, or something like that, nine times out of ten, you're going to walk away in good shape with that, okay? So that's just, you know, there you go. There's a little, little something to walk away with. But what does that really mean? What does it mean? What does it look like in reality, in the real world, to build your life on something that is solid, that never changes, that never moves, that is ultimate truth, like Christ. Well, I think we see a lot of examples in the New Testament. What did Jesus tell the apostles to do? Well, one, to share the gospel. He taught them to lead by serving, which is something our culture has completely backwards. We lead by being the top dog, right? being better than everyone else, and using our power and authority for our benefit. Right? That idea of leading by serving, it, it's, it's really hard to find. I mean, how many, I mean, think about the place where you work, all right, wherever that is, if you're employed. And how many people do you know there that, le that are leaders, they lead by serving? Now, I might be wrong, but I would venture to say that, uh, that we're talking about a very small minority of people. Because we, we have lost that idea that serving and leading is by becoming the least of these. 
So when we say that Christ is the cornerstone and that our life should reflect that and we should build our life on a foundation, one of those things is servanthood. We are building a life of service to others. Because that is what true leadership is. It's serving others. It's, it's recognizing that our value comes not from what we do, what we know or earn or how we perform, but it comes from Christ. It comes from our identity in Christ. Because there's not a single one of us that are deserving of His favor. All right, just like the, the, in, the, in the story, the guy that owned the farm, I mean, he was the one that should be paid. He was the one that deserved something. The tenants didn't. And yet they were selfish and they, they hoarded and they, they wanted more than was there. So they tried to take and steal from the, the farmer that owned that land. And we, I think, can all look at that story and say, well, that's bad. I mean, that's not fair. And yet, that's how many of us, we, lead our, we live our lives that way by being greedy and taking from others rather than giving and serving. How did Christ come? Did He come with great uh, splendor and, and everyone, you know, think, you know, bowing at His feet and, and, and you know, just lavishly like, like the kings of that time, like Herod and Pontius Pilate and the emperor of Rome? Not at all. He was born in a manger, just a few people there, some shepherds. He lived a life of being poor for the most part. I mean, he was a skilled uh, craftsman. He took on his father's trade at, at carpentry. But even when, when he had the opportunity to have wealth and fame, when his ministry was big and, and people were collecting money, what did he say to do with that? He said, give it to the poor. He was truly a servant. And so as a, as a, as a cornerstone, he was someone that, that gave of himself. That, that things flowed out of his life and into others. Whether that be money or material things, or whether that be investing in, in the lives of people. We talked about mentoring last week. We talked about the idea that we have a responsibility to mentor others and to be mentored. And I think for some of us, we don't, we don't see that as a great value, and so we don't place it. We don't spend time doing it. Uh, I mean, ask yourself this question in the last seven days. How much time have you spent mentoring someone or being mentored by someone? I mean, just, just think for just a minute. Probably not very much. Maybe, probably for many, zero. But maybe for some, maybe an hour. Okay, and that's out of how many hours do you have in a week? 24 hours a day. Maybe we sleep six or seven of those. So that's quite a bit of hours of opportunity that we had, and yet we didn't take that opportunity. Because it's not a value for us. It's something that in our culture, it's kind of dog-eat-dog, dog, every man for himself. Um, I mean, that's kind of the, the capitalist way, right? Uh, he who's the richest makes the rules. You know, <laughs> so we kind of have this idea, although you know, there are certainly good things about independence and, and republicanism and you know, those kind of things. But at the same time, we forget about the value of, men of mentoring and being mentored, the value of serving. We're very interested in being served. I mean, think about you know, when it's time to go eat, you go to a restaurant, and what happens? We get served. We go to Walmart to get our food, and what happens? Somebody checks us out. They serve us. Somebody puts stuff on the shelf. They serve us. We're constantly being served all the time. And when we have to serve, what happens? We're like, oh yes, I get to serve. No, we're like, oh man, I gotta go to work. Because when it's time to serve others, we're not very excited about that. And so I wanna challenge you to, to, to really assess your life and don't just give yourself the church answer, oh yeah, Jesus is the cornerstone of my life, blah, blah, blah. But is he really? Is there evidence in your life that, that you are building it around something solid? That you are building a foundation and a legacy for your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and on and on and on that is solid, that, that will not just pass away when you die? You know, it's amazing how much time we spend thinking and planning what will pass, like in terms of physical things, you know, items, heirlooms, money, to our kids. We spend a lot of time thinking about that, right? And that's why we have trusts and we have all kinds of legal ways to, to dodge inheritance tax and, and all these different things so that our children will get our money, our things. 
right? And we, you know, even, you know, when a lot of times in families, you know, parents get old, grandparents get old, people start writing their names underneath stuff. It's like, oh, I want that sewing machine, or I want, you know, we're always thinking about that, concerned about that. But how concerned are we about leaving a legacy that goes beyond those things? Because eventually those things are going to just turn to dust. They came from the elements that are in the ground and, and, and around the earth, and they're going to go back to those same elements. So those things really are, are useless. They're, they're really of no value. We, we place a high value on them, but I think we're like the Pharisees. We don't understand what really has value. But building a life on the principles that God laid out for us, honesty, integrity, servanthood, I believe that though that is the kind of inheritance that will be a lasting inheritance. And so I think we have to reprogram ourselves. And for some of us, I think that means we have to tear some things out and go back to that, that foundation level, to the cornerstone, and put in the right cornerstone and then rebuild again. And how many times have you seen buildings going up, commercial buildings, residential buildings, and they'll build it up and then somebody realizes, oops, we made a mistake. There's something wrong with the concrete. There's, they forgot to put rebar in or you know, something happened and now they, got, they have to kind of knock it down and start over. Why do they do that? Why don't they just keep building? Well, because they know that that thing's going to fall down. Somebody's going to be liable for that. Now, sometimes those things don't get done right and you get a bad building. But for the most part, if we want to do it right, we've just got to knock some things down, tear some things out to make it right. Remember when I was working with my father-in-law, one of the posts that we put in had been anchored in concrete and everything, but there was, they hadn't dug deep enough in this one particular post and so over time it just kind of leaned and leaned and leaned and there's a lot of pressure on it and so it wasn't fixable. We couldn't just lean it back into place and hope it would stay. We had to dig that thing out and actually tie a chain on with a tractor and on the front loader and lift it up you know out of the ground and everything and some roots from a from a tree that was nearby had kind of wrapped around and it was, it was really a mess to tear it down but we knew that if we wanted that fence row to be straight and solid and last for 50 years that was something we had to do. We had to tear it out. And I think that there are some things that in, in each of our lives that we're just going to have to kind of do some demolition on so that we can get back and rebuild the right way. And what does that look like? What does that mean? Well, I think sometimes that means we have to go to, to friends and family and ask forgive, for forgiveness. There's things that we've taught our children that are wrong and we need to go to, to them in, in repentance and say, hey, you know what? This thing that, that's in my life, the way that I've lived it out, it, it's wrong. And, and, and I want you to know that, and I, and I know that. And, and as a family, we're going we're gonna to build something different. I, I've, my opinion, and this is not in the Bible, this is just my opinion by Jonathan House. I think one of the greatest challenges that the American family has today is, is the consumerist mindset. The idea that having things is the pinnacle of life and the acquiring things. Because our kids grow up seeing all the things that they want. And if we shortcut them in getting those things, we don't teach them the values of hard work and earning and savings, then we, we are condemning them to the consequences of that consumerist worldview, which bankruptcy is pretty well the inroad for that. Because you can only borrow money for so long, and eventually you can't, your credit runs out and you're dead in the water. And I think that happens on a spiritual level. That we can kind of borrow and cheat and steal through life, but eventually we're in a place of spiritual bankruptcy. If our Christian life is nothing more than coming to church, saying the Lord's Prayer, putting some money in the offering plate, it's an empty, it's an empty faith. Anybody can do that. An atheist can do that. But a legitimate... And honest faith is something that requires the cor a cornerstone. Taylor, I'm going to invite you to come up and start playing as we close. If you're like me at all, you've, you've heard a message kind of like this a lot. And sometimes I think we become um, just calloused to the idea that maybe there's something wrong in our life. We just don't like to hear that. That there's something wrong with our life. That there's things that we need to change in our life. Who likes change really? 
I mean, I think probably of all of you, I like change more than anybody, but at the end of the day, change just wears me out. I don't like learning new things. Um, I don't like starting all over on stuff. I just kind of like to coast and go with the status quo. It's the least amount of work needed. But that will only get us so far. And Jesus says that if we reject the cornerstone, then we are building a foundation in our life that is doomed to crumble and fail. So I would just like for every head to be bowed and every eye to be closed for just a couple moments. And I would like for us as a church just to come to a time of repentance. I don't know what it is, addictions, being lovers of money, unforgiveness towards someone else, not willing to take the time to teach our children the way they should go, unforgiveness against parents or anger. I don't know what it is, but I want you to, to just give those things to the Lord. Let Him change you. Let Him stir up within you those things that in your mind need to change in your life. Lord, I pray that right now in these moments that your Holy Spirit would convict us of the things in our life that need to change. Lord, I believe that as your Spirit works in ways that we can't always see and understand, but that you can make us aware of those things without it being a complicated process. And God, right now, I pray that your spirit would be so powerful that not a one of us would walk away today without the realization of those things in our life that, that we need to make right. God, I thank you that you are patient with us. Just like the owner that sent many, many servants in the hopes of reaching the tenant. God, I pray that once again that you would have mercy on us and you would send yet another messenger to speak to us today. And God, I pray that as we think about the things that were said this afternoon, tonight, and in the days that are to come this week, that, that we would be changed. That we would have a heart that is willing and ready to make those things right, Lord, that we would see the truth, that we would not be deceived by the enemy and by his lies or by the world and what it says, that we would truly be your people, and that you would be the cornerstone of our lives. We just thank you, Lord, and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, I hope everybody has a great week.